Hi, I'm Kyle Harrison, and I'm going to talk to you today about crisis resource management. So let's get started. First of all, I have no conflicts of interest, and I have no disclosures. So this is a schematic that uh, represents the key principles of crisis resource management, and I'm going to talk about each one uh, in depth uh, later in this lecture. But before I do that, let's first talk about kind of the evolution of, of a crisis. Now, although a crisis is often perceived as sudden in nature and rapid in onset, you can usually identify a series of events that actually precede the actual crisis. This can be very useful for future reference because you may be able to intervene and, and stop a crisis from occurring in the future if you can understand kind of what some of these uh, preceding uh, factors are. So let's go into in depth uh, a couple of these. So the first event in the evolution of a crisis is a triggering event. So something has to start the ball rolling, if you will. And a triggering event often will arise from three sets of underlying conditions. It may arise from a latent error in a system, a predisposing factor within the environment, or a psychological precursor uh, in the uh, practitioners or care providers. So what is a latent error? So latent error is something that lays dormant within a system, sometimes for a long time, which only becomes evident when they combine with other factors to breach the system's defenses. So an example may be a design flaw. So something is designed and 99% and of the time it works great, but in 1% of the time in, in, in either an experienced person's hands or in someone who has maybe a different interpretation of how the equipment should be used, that design flaw flares up and the equipment is used inappropriately, resulting in an error. Additionally, you may have manufacturing defects. Maybe uh, equipment may fail. Maybe it may fail at an opportune time, and, and that would be a latent error. And you have, may, have, may have maintenance issues where either things are inadequately uh, uh, undergo a maintenance uh, or uh, maintenance results in, in a, in a uh, workaround that no longer uh, allows the, 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 event, the uh, piece of equipment to, to work appropriately. The key is that these all just kind of lay there, and they're like little uh, little crocodiles, if you will, laying in the in the swamp, ready to grab you if uh, if the conditions are just right. Um, these may combine with other issues like a predisposing factor, and these could be both external or internal uh, to the environment. Some predisposing factors may be the patient's underlying disease process. So if you have a very sick patient and a piece of equipment fails, that may have a, a result in a crisis uh, or a more significant crisis than if that same piece of equipment fails in a healthy person because a sicker patient may not be able to tolerate this, uh, this uh, equipment failure. Maybe in the environment of the healthcare delivery system, you know, is it at three in the morning when you may have limited resources because of, of uh, short staffing uh, when you have that sick patient and the piece of equipment fails. So you have both internal and external um, factors as well as the predisposing um, factors and the latent errors all kind of playing in to crisis evolution. Finally, you have the psychological precursors. So you've got the equipment, you've got the environment, now you've got the individual that may result, the, that may contribute to a crisis. Um, primary psych Primary psychological precursors are referred to as performance shaping factors. You know, what makes someone perform the way they do? They're, they're uh, listed here. Some of these are not uh, exclusively list or extensively listed, but there are a few here, so let's talk about them. Fatigue. Uh, we, not, we know that fatigue is a, an independent predictor of poor performance. Um, illness, both physical or mental. Um, arrogance. Uh, or hazardous attitudes, the people who feel that the rules don't apply to them uh, and may uh, be more prone to uh, uh, errors. Drug use, both prescribed or illicit. So you get the idea that you've got these factors, these sh performance shaping factors that may play out uh, as a crisis evolves so that people don't perform uh, to their best because of these various factors. So you've got, once again, the equipment, the environment, and the individual all with factors at play that allow a crisis to evolve further. 
Now in the evolution of a crisis, it's important to know that you've got the triggering event with those three underlying factors playing it, playing out. And then as when things occur, you start creating an incident. So you've got the predisposing factors, a trigger event occurs, it progresses into an incident. And an incident is defined as an event or a problem that is, will not resolve on its own and is likely to continue to evolve. You, this is where you need to intervene. Good crisis management means that you intervene when you're at the incident phase to try and prevent it from moving further. You, this may not be possible, but if it, if it is possible, it's best to intervene prior to this incident progressing to what we may call a critical incident. And this is where the incident may cause direct adverse outcome to the patient. So critical incident is kind of the worst. That's where the patient will receive uh, an injury or be harmed. So we want to involve, we want to intervene in the incident phase, definitely before it gets to a critical incident, but those take good crisis management principles, which we'll go over. Now, crisis management requires dynamic decision making. This is a skill that most people don't have. You have to practice this. Uh, it takes practice. It takes uh, effort. Um, uh, very few people have the innate ability to be active, dynamic decision makers. Um, and it's important to know that uh, in dynamic situations, the ability of the healthcare worker to respond to many sources of rapidly changing information is challenging. You know, you, 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 the, the patient's condition changes rapidly. The environment in which you care for the patient changes rapidly. You have to be able to be uh, nimble on your feet and think quickly and, and uh, be very proactive to be a good crisis manager. So how did we come up with the idea of crisis resource management in healthcare? Well, we actually borrowed it from the aviation industry because they started it back in the 70s. And the reason they started it was simply the FAA discovered that a significant number of airline accidents occurring in the 70s were directly related to pilot error because the crews could not work together as a team. These were often functional planes that were flown into the ground by well-meaning crews, but because they weren't able to work together, a bad outcome occurred, obviously, for both the pilots as well as the passengers. The FAA created a series of principles to help train pilots and then eventually whole crews on how to handle crises. My colleagues here at Stanford and the Palo Alto VA actually adapted these principles to healthcare back in the early 90s and actually published the seminal book on crisis management and anesthesiology, where they mapped out how these principles could be useful in healthcare. So now let's go over these key points. So, First point uh, to talk about is know the environment. Then we'll talk about anticipate and planning, using all available information, how to allocate your attention wisely, how to mobilize available resources, how to use cognitive aids appropriately and effectively. Then we'll talk about how to designate leadership, how to establish role clarity in a crisis, how and when to call for help, effective communication strategies, and finally, how you distribute the workload. Now, all throughout this application, this app that you're going to be using to learn ACRM and CRM, ACLS and CRM, excuse me, we're going to try and point out some of these key points in some of the videos that we've created. We want to show you some examples, concrete examples of how to do this so that you can practice this in your own uh, clinical practice. So the first one, let's talk about know your environment. So it's important in a crisis to maintain situational awareness. That means you need to know what's happening, both what's happening at that moment, what's likely to happen the next minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, um, so that you can think dynamically and react accordingly. The aviation industry likes to talk about when you're flying a plane, you want to be flying ahead of the plane, not behind the plane. If a plane's going 500 miles an hour, it's very it's, it's not okay to know what's a mile ahead. You need to know what's several miles ahead if you're going that fast. So as a crisis manager, you need to know, you know where you are and where you're headed. It's important that you know how things work. You know how things work both mechanically, how equipment works, you know how your environment works at different hours, what resources are available. 
and you need to know the strengths and weaknesses of your environment so that you can address the weaknesses and accentuate the strengths depending on uh, what environment this crisis is occurring in. Anticipate and plan. You want to plan and prepare for high workload periods during low workload periods. So as you may be gearing up for a crisis, you start anticipating maybe a crisis is occurring, you may want to start preparing for that in case the crisis actually occurs. Being proactive, the patient's hypotensive, you may want to start thinking, well, what if this patient codes? How am I going to intervene? Maybe I need to get additional help. I'm going to start escalating care. You also want to know where you are and where you're likely headed. It's so important to plan ahead in a crisis, similar to the situational awareness of knowing where you are, you want to know where you're headed. Participate and plan is crucial to be a good crisis manager. You want to use all available information. So no one stream of information will give you all the answers in a crisis. You need to use as many resources and, and redundant streams of information as possible so that you're assured that you're getting the right information. It's a very high, volatile, uh, chaotic, and sometimes confusing environment in a crisis. So learning to use all available resources and all available information is important. You want to check and cross-check your information. If something gives you faulty information, you need to cross-check it to make sure that it's, it's uh, accurate. You don't want to make a treatment decision on erroneous information. And understand that neither clinical observation nor any single monitor can give you the entire clinical picture. You need to rely on, the, uh, on as much information as possible to have a clear picture of what's happening in a crisis. You want to allocate your attention wisely. Now this means that you, you know, we know that your attention is a limited resource. So you need to eliminate or reduce distractions as much as possible. You want to monitor for task saturations and, and data overload. You want to avoid getting fixated on one particular um, idea or one particular procedure. And it, you may need to recruit others to help you. Uh, this is the, the, where it's important that you don't do any physical task as a leader so that you don't have your attention absorbed in a procedure and that would take you away from effectively monitoring the environment and the patient. It's important to use cognitive aids whenever they're available. This is because your working memory is limited. This is especially uh, so in a crisis. So you may be able to on a test recite the five H's and the five T's that you need to rule out for a PEA, but a PEA arrest, but in, a, in the heat of the moment, your adrenaline's pumping, you tend to constrict the ability to access uh, your long-term memory stores. Uh, where you need to put things from long-term memory into your working memory. So this failure to, re to retrieve that information uh, can result in a bad outcome. So we encourage you to use checklist or cognitive aids whenever possible. Uh, there's a, we've created a book, uh, Crisis Management, um, that actually has the algorithms for uh, most uh, emergency uh, conditions, including the ACLS uh, events. And you'll see us using uh, cognitive aids throughout this um, uh, application because it's important uh, because you can't remember everything and we shouldn't be expected to. Other healthcare, I mean, excuse me, other industries such as aviation, nuclear power, they use cognitive aids for every crisis. In healthcare, we need to learn that we need to use these. It's the only way to, to affect, uh, to provide the best care possible. I'm going to mobilize available resources. Now, this is important because you want to utilize all resources available to you, and whether that be equipment, additional staff, uh, the kind of aids, internet hotlines, you're not alone in a crisis. There are lots of people around, and there are often lots of people that can help you. But they may not know that you need help, so you need to mobilize them uh, and bring them to the crisis to assist. It's important that you, as a leader, take command. Resuscitations go poorly when there's not a clear leadership structure. The team needs someone to follow. So you want to make sure that the team knows who's in charge if you're the leader. The team leader also decides what needs to be done, prioritizes this necessary task, 
and then assigns them to spe specific individuals, ideally the individuals that are most likely to accomplish your goals, meaning the most experienced person. There's a, the, I, there's a, a statement, authority with participation and assertiveness with respect. The idea is that you're, you're the leader, but you need everyone to assist you in this. Often in a crisis, I will say, I'm the leader, but I need everyone to help me run this event. Your input is vital. Please feel free to contribute uh, to this crisis so we can make the best outcome for the patient. As part of the leader, you want to make sure that you establish role clarity so that everyone knows who is supposed to do what. You want to assign areas of responsibility to the appropriate person, make sure they have the adequate knowledge, skills, and training because you need things to happen quickly and efficiently. You also need to monitor to make sure that if someone isn't able to accomplish that task that you reassign them. And people will often just fall into roles, but you may need to be explicit in your communication and make sure that all roles are, are being uh, filled out, uh, completed, uh, such as who's the airway person, who are the compressive CPR people, who is your med administrator, who's recording, who's running the defibrillator. Those may, you may have to be explicit and, and often the best performers do become very explicit in the language and, and in communication and give very clear roles to their team and teammates. It's important to call for help early. You want to declare an emergency earlier rather than later. There's a hesitancy to think I can control, I'm in control of this, things aren't so bad, I'm okay. And only once the thing really gets out of control do people call for help. You want to declare an emergency soon enough to make a difference. So don't wait till the patient's in full arrest. If they're almost, if they're headed towards rapid um, decompensation and look like they're going to arrest soon, go ahead and call the code before the patient arrests. They were the patient, the team may be there before the patient arrests and may be able to prevent the arrest. Or if you can't, at least they're there right when the patient arrests. Declaring an emergency mobilizes needed resources and quickly communicates to both the team as well as the entire hospital that a crisis is at hand. Communicate effectively. Communication is often pointed out as one of the most important factors in poor outcomes. We must communicate effectively in healthcare, especially under crisis conditions. It's important that you don't raise your voice unless absolutely necessary. And then you want to bring it back down. If the room is too loud, simply request everyone be quiet for a moment so you can gain control of the room, but then yelling is likely to not improve performance. People, I think, often feel if they yell loud enough that they will gain respect. This often does not work. You do want to state your commands and request clearly so that people can understand them, and it's important to avoid making statements into thin air. And what I mean by that? Well, Someone get the crash cart. Well, the problem with that statement is who's going to do that? Either no one or several people are, will go and get it. And you only want one person to do it. So task one person. Joan, I want you to get the crash cart. Ideally, use closed loop communication. And then Joan says, I'm going to get the crash cart. And then when the crash cart comes in, Joan announces, crash cart has arrived. This is important. Closing the communication loop uh, is, is crucial so that the person reflects that they hear you and then they reflect back to you that they understand and uh, are going to accomplish what you request of them. As I talked about before, you want to foster an atmosphere of open exchange amongst all personnel so that everyone on the team, no matter who it is, feels comfortable sharing information with you as a leader so that you can make the most uh, effective decisions. And if there's ever a conflict, it's important to focus on what is right for the patient rather than who is right. You can always take disagreements offline. Once again, focus on who is, who, what is right for the patient rather than who is right in a crisis if there's ever conflict amongst team members. I kind of discussed this before, but we'll readdress it, distributing the workload, putting it to the people who are going to get the job done. As I said before, also, the team leader should not be involved in manual tasks unless absolutely necessary. 
And if they do need to do the task, which may happen, then you need to assign someone to monitor the environment while you do the procedure. And, and because there's no way you can do a procedure and, and uh, monitor and, and control the environment as the leader. You're constantly want to scan your team to make sure that there's one person who's not overloaded or that it's not failing. Therefore, you may, if that's the case, then you'll redistribute the assignments to someone else or break that workload into smaller portions to give to other people. This is a schematic that kind of reiterates everything. Once again, establishing clear leadership and forming team members who is, who is in charge, calling for help early enough to make a difference, establishing role clarity, determining who will do what, assigning areas of responsibility, distributing the workload so you can assign specific tasks to team members according to their ability, revising as needed, communicating effectively, avoiding thin air statements, using closed loop communication, fostering an open exchange of information, anticipating planning, preparing for a crisis before the crisis occurs, knowing where you are and where you're likely headed in a crisis, knowing your environment, maintaining situational awareness, understanding the strengths and vulnerabilities in the environment, using all available information, cross-checking your information, allocating your attention wisely, eliminating your distractors, and mobilizing all of your resources, including cognitive aids. We're, like I said, we're going to try and go over these topics again throughout this um, app so that you understand them and see them in action. And then I want you to practice them in the real world. They take practice, but through effort, you can become an excellent crisis resource manager. Thank you very much.